Uh, my name is Shmuel Bialy, and I'm coming from snowy Boston. Uh, I came like this. This was my vehicle when I came here. <laughs> um, and my talk will be concentrated based on these two papers, uh, one or two years ago with Blakesley, and also now uh, also with Blakesley and Emil Sternberg, my former PhD advisor in Tel Aviv. Now I'm at the CFA in Harvard, and also other collaborators. And the idea here is really, I think it's quite interesting that it connects uh, several fields of uh, chemistry, astrochemistry, and turbulence uh, to study the structure of turbulence in the interstellar medium. So this, this thing here, the interstellar medium, the ISM, and that's the background image here, that's an example of a piece of the interstellar medium of our galaxy, that's the Carina Nebula, and I think it's really just nice to stare at it, but I'll continue to talk and, <laughs> and won't let you stare at it. So uh, just to start with a short overview, because we come from different fields, uh, about the interstellar medium and the turbulence in it. So in the interstellar medium, flows become very rapidly turbulent because the high Reynolds number, if you wish, you can just uh, very easily estimate the Reynolds number is about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, sometimes even more. So any flow become very turbulent, and it may be supersonic or subsonic depending on the uh, phase of the ISM, and that was my previous question that I asked about the H1, for example, because we know that the H1 can be, the H1, the atomic hydrogen, may be either, either quite warm, about 10 to the 4 degrees, or cold, uh, about 100 degrees. That's because we have different cooling uh, mechanisms in the interstellar medium and heating mechanisms for stellar UV light and cooling from line emission, um, which cools the gas to these temperatures. So the cold gas is usually supersonic, the warm is subsonic, and the densities are quite low, much lower than what we hear in these experiments. So high density would be 100, 100 particles per centimeter cube, and low density is about one particle per centimeter cube. And we still call it gas, not vacuum. Um, and importantly, the stars form in this cold atomic uh, molecular clouds that are somewhat denser and are known to be very turbulent and supersonic. And later, Vadim will also tell us about the importance of turbulence in regulating the rate of star formation in galaxies. So turbulence plays a very crucial role in astrophysics. So the main goal here is, can we somehow cons better constrain the properties of turbulence? And with special focus on this talk, on what drives, what can be the main driver of turbulence in galaxies and the interstellar medium? Is it driven on large scales from the gravitational potential of the galaxy that induce motions? Or is it more on smaller scales, what we call feedback from supernova or even outflows and winds from stars? And the idea is as follows, just to sketch. So we have the turbulence. And the turbulence, when supersonic, it produces density fluctuations because it's compressible turbulence. And now when, when we have density fluctuations, because chemical reactions are very sensitive to the density, this also produces fluctuations in the abundances of various chemical uh, species, molecules, ions, etc. Now these, chemical these chemicals and the abundances of these things, we can observe chemicals with spectroscopy, with space-based telescopes. So if we observe the chemical reaction, the chemical abundances, we can reverse the arrows and use the fluctuations in the chemical abundances to tell us something about the density structure and then back to tell us something about the turbulence. So that's the basic idea. And then we, uh, if we constrain this, we can maybe say something about the driver of turbulence in the ISM. So let me jump in directly to our spherical cow model. And how do we do this? So what we do, we run a hydrodynamic uh, simulation, or MHD, magnetohydrodynamic simulation box. The box is driven on large scale, and the turbulence naturally cascades to smaller and smaller scales. 
uh, we have uh, solenoidal solen driving and is a thermal equation of state. And importantly, I'll focus here on these two parameters, the sonic Mach number, which kind of tells you the strength of the turbulence, and the driving scale, the, the scale where you drive the turbulence. That tells you what would be the, the scale of the density fluctuations. The larger the driving scale, that would be also the larger scale density fluctuations, and small will give you a smaller uh, scale of density fluctuations. So a spherical cow uh, turns into a, a box cow, and that's the box cow. So this is an um, image of the density field when integrated along one axis. Let's call it the line of sight, what you'd see if you have a telescope pointing into this uh, turbulent box. Now, what we assume that there is a UV light irradiating this simulation and cosmic rays also. And now we solve a model of chemical reactions. That model uh, include a gas phase reaction and dust reactions, as long as, along with UV radi radiation, photodissociation of molecules, cosmic ionization of molecules and ions. Uh, to calculate the abundances of various chemical species, molecules, atoms, ions. So importantly, this density field is the input for our chemical model. So in the end, the abundances, as I also mentioned before, the abundances of various molecules depend on this density field, which in turn depend on the, the, den the turbulent parameters, such as <coughs> the Mach number and the driving scale. Then we take these calculated abundances and compare them with observations. That's the idea. Importantly, we have to run several simulations because we want to uh, constrain the turbulent parameters. So we run uh, six sim simulation boxes for different combinations of driving scale, L drive, and Mach numbers. So we have six boxes like this. And actually, I have more boxes because we have the different uh, molecules and atoms. For each of them, we calculate a box like this uh, map of the um, abundance integrated along the line of sight. We always have to integrate along one uh, axis because that's what we see in observations. We never see the volume uh, density of species. We always see integrated column densities. So let me uh, jump now to the results. And I want to focus on uh, three sets of results. Um, one is what is the role of the sonic Mach number in our simulations. Then what's the role of the driving scale? And finally, to compare with observations and see what we can learn from them. OK, so here I show an example of uh, what you get for the H1 from the atomic hydrogen. Again, we ha take the box, we integrate along one axis. We get the H1 column density. That's number, number of atomic hydrogen per centimeter square. Or maybe I should say uh, inch square or in the US. I know. Um, I, no, I, I won't do that. <laughs> so that's the number of h per centimeter square h atoms integrating along one line of sight. And uh, you see some amount of fluctuations. Uh, typical numbers are like 10 to the 20 uh, atoms per centimeter cube uh, 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 square. Um, and that's the PDF. It's quite narrow. Now, what happened when we changed the Mach number? So what I showed before, this was a sonic Mach number of a half. So that's uh, pressure dominated. Now, when we go to supersonic turbulence, now density fluctuations really develop. The turbulence become compressible. And as a result, we also have fluctuations in the abundance of H, atomic hydrogen, and H2. And now we have, really, we see in the map, strong fluctuations between different regions, different lines of sight. The PDF become narrow, uh, the PDF become wide. So generally, as the Mach number increases, strong density fluctuation develop, and the dispersion in the column density of atomic hydrogen becomes large. Now, what's the effect of the driving scale? And I think it's, it's quite important to also um, focus on that. Because often, I feel, at least in astrophysics, 
people sometimes neglect this. They very often talk about the Mach number, sometimes about the beta parameter, but not so much about the scale of driving. And this is also very important because we have now here, we have an averaging effect. When the driving scale is large, the scale of each density fluctuation, and when I say a scale of density fluctuation, I mean maybe the scale over which the density is correlated. The scale of each density fluctuation is large, and as we look in different lines of sight, we really, in each line of sight, we really see just one or several density fluctuations, not many. As we decrease the driving scale, we have many, many small density fluctuations. As we integrate along the line of sight, we integrate them over. Positive and negative density fluctuations average out, and different lines of sight become more alike. And that's, uh, for that reason, this H1 map becomes more uh, uniform the density fluctuations here are smaller just because they are averaged out as we integrate a long line of sight, and the PDF becomes narrow. So really, the PDF can be narrow or wide, not just because effects of Mach number, but also because of the scale of density fluctuations, the scale of turbulence driving. To summarize these two points, the dispersion in H1, but also in other species, I just show here H1 as an example, increases as the Mach number increases because the fluctuation intensity increases, and it increases as the driving scale increases because the fluctuation length scale or coherence scale increases. Now let's apply this to observations. Let's see what we have in real observations. So in, these, in this quite busy plot, what I show is three models for the three rows. This is a model of subsonic, the subsonic box. This is a supersonic, but driven on small scales. And this is supersonic driven on large scales. And in e each, each row here is a different uh, molecular ion species, argonium H+, plus, OH+, plus, H2+. Plus. This is some molecular ions that are observed in the interstellar medium. And this is mutual PDF of these molecular ions with the column density of H1 that we saw before. So that's mutual PDF, but you can really concentrate on the x-axis, the width of the PDF. Here, the three regions here is, is the 1, 2, and 3 sigma, so 68, 95, and 97 percentiles of the probability distribution function of these uh, molecular ions. And this crosses our observations from the Herschel Space Telescope towards different locations in, the, in our galaxy. Uh, what we can see is clearly the subsonic case, the observations have much larger dispersion than uh, what predicted by theory, if we take the subsonic simulation. As we increase this, uh, the Mach number from subsonic to supersonic, the PDF becomes wider, but still not wide enough. And really to account and to explain the large dispersion seen in the observations, we need not only supersonic, but also large-scale turbulence driving. So really, this is the one that really best matches the observations. Still, it's not a perfect match. Our model is still very simplified. It's either thermal turbulence, is a box. Interstellar medium is not a box. Um, and other assumptions uh, that are made in our simulation. But this is just to show the general uh, effect of uh, the Mach number and the driving scale. So based on observations and model, we can say that supersonic large-scale driven turbulence best matches the observations. A but. Okay, there's always a but. And there's, of course, few caveats to the study. Oh, we are here, we're again in the United States, so maybe I should say uh, future prospect. Um, <laughs> so uh, first thing is, I think that uh, future prospect, some future developments that might uh, occur is to include time-dependent chemistry. So here in this model, we assumed chemical equilibrium. This might be a good assumption in some cases, but not always. So depending on the time scale, of the turbulent motions, if it becomes short compared to the chemical reaction time scale, 
then we then the ke uh, chemistry can be out of chemical equilibrium. Uh, then, as I asked, and now I can also my ask my, myself, what about uh, the ISM being not isothermal? We have different phases, the warm and cold, and this can really have a huge effect uh, on the abundances of molecules and ions. For example, you don't expect to get any molecules whatsoever in the warm um, neutral medium. Then we can have also fluctuations in other things. I focused here on turbulence, but uh, the abundances of, of molecules depend also on the UV radiation strengths, on the cosmic ray ionization rate, which can also fluctuate between uh, locations in the galaxy. Uh, I would like to, uh, to, to, ha to say a few more words on this, uh, because really it's, it's kind of, we have a degeneracy here, because the abundances of these molecules, argonium H+, plus, <coughs> OH+, plus, H2+, plus, that I showed, really depend on the cosmic ionization rate. But on the other hand, the way we know what's the cosmic ionization rate in our galaxy is also from these same molecules. So we need a different tracer of the cosmic ionization rate if we want to break this degeneracy between turbulence and fluctuation in the cosmic ionization rate. And recently I proposed such a new method, um, still to be explored uh, in observations, and the idea is uh, to use H2, molecular hydrogen, which is the main constituent of the gas in molecular clouds, as a probe of cosmic rays. The idea is cosmic rays come, hit an H2 molecule, excite it, then the H2 molecule, when it relaxes to the ground state, it emits a photon or vibrational line in the infrared. And if we observe this photon, we can constrain the excitation uh, rate, which is the cosmic ray ionization rate. So this might be a new method to constrain the cosmic ray ionization rate uh, in the galaxy, in molecular clouds. Once we do all this, once this all is checked, uh, we can go to the last step and use this method of chemical abundances to constrain turbulence properties and the driving of turbulence in the interstellar medium. Thank you. Thank you, Shmuel. Any questions? Um, is anyone there? Uh, yeah. yeah, so... Uh, so even incompressible turbulence can also drive density fluctuations by solenoidal motions. So my first question is whether it's possible to distinguish uh, or whether it's important to distinguish the density fluctuations coming from solenoidal motions and compressible motions in turbulence. And uh, the second question is in your comparisons observations, that is very interesting. Um, how can you tell that this large-scale density fluctuations and small-scale density fluctuations they come from the same cascade? OK, so I first try to answer your uh, first question. So uh, first of all, yes, uh, also in the sub First of all, in our simulations, it's solenoidal driving. Um, and also in the subsonic simulations, we do get density fluctuations. Uh, and that's why you, you see here uh, uh, this so fluctuations in the column density, which is lower than what, if, even this is high, if you look at the density field, it's, it's even more extreme. This, this is already integrated along line of sight. So you do have it, and you have a continuous increase in the amount of fluctuations as you increase the subsonic. It's not like abrupt from homogeneous to suddenly you get fluctuations. Uh, indeed, uh, in astrophysics, we also have this magical B parameter, which uh, connects between the amount of density, f or between connects between the dispersion of density and the Mach number, and this depends on the type of driving, if it's solenoidal or compressional. So it's kind of degenerate. It's it's true. It's very hard to disentangle. I don't have a good answer for this. Blake, do you have an idea? Yeah, I mean, basically the PDF depends on both of these things. So you have. Uh, so an effective kind of Mach degenerate. number that measures the, the overall compression, whether it's from the type of driving mechanism or from the Mach number. Yeah, so it's kind of degenerate. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I see there's lots of questions. Time for one more. Um, <laughs>
The chemistry to the turbulence, not so much. The chemistry is mainly a tracer. Oh, no, 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 no. The reverse loop is just to, that we can... This is the physics, go to one direction, and then this is the experiment. We can use this to study the physics. There's no... no, no I mean, there's small effect, but it's not, it's not serious. Mm. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of more complicated than what I uh, outlined in this talk, because each one here is really also very strongly affected by the UV radiation. So it's not just the, the... What we see here is not just the density fluctuations. It's the combined effect of the density fluctuations and the chemistry, which has to do with how the UV radiation is absorbed as it gets further and further, deeper and deeper into the cloud. This is a very nonlinear process. So it's a combined effect of chemistry, if you call it chemistry or whatever you call it, and uh, turbulence. I, I think it has to do with the physical mechanism of H1, H2 photo dissociation and H1 um, formation through this photo dissociation. And we kind of try to explain this in this uh, first paper. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of tangled with the turbulence, so it's hard to give a full, very straight explanation, but I think it has to do with this physics. Okay, thank you, Shmuel. Let's have uh, Vadim come up.